You're listening to the Well Woman Podcast. I'm your host, Gemma Lee, women's menstrual cycle educator, natural fertility coach, and daytime mermaid. This is a place where we discuss all things periods, poo, ovulation, fertility, and sex. Join me weekly as we rediscover our menstrual cycles, unlock its superpowers, and guide you back into your cyclical nature. Lindsay, welcome to the Well Woman podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be such a juicy chat. We've just been chatting for 20 minutes before we even hit record. So I'm really excited that we finally hit record and that you're here. So tell us all what day of your cycle are you on and how are you checking in? How do you feel in this moment today? Yes. So I am on my third day of my cycle. So in this moment today, especially, I just feel grounded (laughs) and really connected uh, which is great. I always give myself a lot of grace during this time. I slow down. That was really my intention this week was to just have that grace on myself, like for myself, um, during this time to be able to slow down. I think a lot of business owners were always just submerged in this do more culture. So especially during this time, I'm like, okay, what can I do to practice self-care. Like I took the morning off to, you know, do my favorite self-care activities and drink a lot of water and eat some good food. So I'm feeling pretty grounded today. Oh, I love that. And I also really love that you mentioned about the do more culture because for born menstruators, there's a lot of pressure to be in the do more culture, but sometimes less is more. Oh, absolutely. I think I mean, we'll talk more about this, but how I live my life just with intention. And I think a lot of times intention is taken away when we're in that do more culture because we're just checking things off the box, right? We're checking things off the to-do list. And it's just when we do things with intention, I feel, you know, so much more um, connected to the things and purposeful when I do them. So. Mm, juicy. I love that. Thank you. Now, everyone who's listening to this is probably like, who is Lindsay? Tell us, who are you? And today we are talking all about brain health and the brain connection with the cycle. So why are you the person to talk to about this? Like, how did you get into this space of talking about the brain? Yes. So uh, the brain is such a beautiful, expansive topic. My background is medicine. And so I started off as a practitioner uh, here in the States and love working as a practitioner. My background's internal medicine. And then I ended up getting very sick with a chronic illness. So I was diagnosed with Lyme disease and some other viruses and um, infections, kind of those long-term infections. And I had chronic pain, you know, fatigue, migraines, anxiety, hormonal dysregulation, like all of these symptoms kind of came up. (laughs) It seemed to be overnight. And I know now it was a buildup over time, but the symptoms were really severe stuff. I had never experienced before. I had never experienced anxiety quite like this, you know, and, and I was starting to be sensitive to foods and to chemicals and to things in my environment. So I had to stop working. I stopped my entire life and started to really seek help, you know, figure out, okay, what can I do to feel better? And every day I was surviving every day. I was going to different appointments. There was a time where I was bed bound, you know, for a couple of months because the pain was so severe in my joints, the migraines were bad. Sometimes I had hallucinations. It was quite, quite overwhelming to this system. And my background in medicine allowed me to kind of have a plan for treatment and detox and changing my lifestyle, changing my diet, changing all of these things. But I wasn't feeling better. And that was 
one of the most frustrating things because I was doing all of the right things, right? Mm -hmm. I was taking the supplements and I changed my diet and I'm sleeping and I'm, um, you know, treating and all of these things. And I wasn't feeling better. And that's when I started to think out of the box. So having gone to school and studied about the brain, I knew a little bit, but I came across a blog post about neuroplasticity, which just means the brain's ability to change. And this post was specific to when you have a chronic illness, the brain is communicating danger to the body. And so you can call it sympathetic dominance. You can call it the fight or flight response, the freeze response. Basically, it's our own mammalian physiological way to receive that message of danger and communicate it to the rest of the body that danger is present. And it's how our body responds to something dangerous, whether it's a virus or bacteria, a traumatic situation, a pandemic, like these different traumas that we experience in our lives and the body can respond And it made so much sense because this woman in particular was describing her situation and how she was doing all the right things, but her body was still reactive. Mm. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, those moments where you have like this aha moment and you're just like, you know, you the breath like leaves your body and you feel this reprieve. You're like, oh, this is it. This is the thing. And you know, that was, that was it for me, the missing piece to my treatment plan, because I don't regret doing any of the things I, I did and learning how to live in a more non-toxic environment and eating well and all of these things. But this was the thing for me that led me to my full recovery. So I started learning about everything there is to know about the brain. There's amazing researchers out there, amazing neuroscientists studying this. And I read as many of the books as I could. I started taking courses and I started to get better. And I started to use these structured tools throughout the day to start to shift out of that sympathetic dominant or chronic stress response. And so it's breaking that cycle again and again and communicating a new reality to your body. So instead of being in that danger, fight, freeze, response, I started to communicate safety and peace and ease. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. I used um, you know, a lot of different mental exercises and combined with breathing, combined with movement, um, combined with some really structured, some amazing structured tools that started to break that cycle. And I taught myself how to eat the foods I love again and move again and, you know, fulfill lifelong dreams that I had for myself again. And so really, uh, it was this incredible process because for anyone who's had hormonal dysregulation or has been diagnosed with a chronic condition like PCOS, you know, a lot of times we're given this (laughs) blanket statement of you're never going to get better, just learn to live with the symptoms. Uh, You know, this, this horrible (laughs) statement that often practitioners say, and I just knew I was like, this, this isn't going to be me. I'm not going to be that person. And if anything, I'm quite an independent person. I wanted to prove them wrong. I was like, I'll show them. And just you wait and see. Exactly. I did. Yeah. I wanted to like send out like notices when I started to feel better to like every practitioner I ever saw, which I did not, but one practitioner in particular, he's a really good friend of mine here in Austin and we still communicate. He sends me his patients all the time. Be, and and there's great practitioners out there who love this work. So that's why I started Vital Side. So that was about five years ago is I saw that this was missing from the wellness and the medical community. And oftentimes we're given a lot of really great tools by uh, life coaches and breathwork practitioners, but there was a, a gap between medicine 
and then this work, this really amazing retrain your brain, you know, regulate your nervous system work. And I really wanted to fill that gap. And so that's what I started to do. So one of the first things I started doing was educating practitioners on this. Um, and, and to this day, that's how I, I get a lot of referrals, but I love pairing this with a lot of really wonderful functional tools and, you know, creating this more holistic picture of, wellness. And so that's what I did. I created Vital Side. I quickly formed an online platform and that's what I've been doing. And it has been, been such a wonderful um, blessing in my life. And I've worked with thousands of people all over the world. It's just been really, really incredible work. Mm, so empowering. Thank you for sharing. Your story is beautiful. I think all, 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 all stories are beautiful in, in their own way, but it's so relatable regardless of the the challenge the health challenge that someone might experience that whole feeling of I'm doing all the fucking things why the fuck don't I feel better and you know that can be a real deep hole that you can find yourself in if you don't know how to dig yourself out and I I think that a lot of people forget about the brain and I think when we eat there's so much you know, I've been in the health industry for what is it, 17 years now. And I started out seven years in the nutrition industry. And there's so much focus on gut health, digestion, liver health, skin. I also could add in the menstrual cycle because I, you know, my whole gram feed on Instagram is just all the menstrual cycle stuff. But um, people don't talk about the brain. And I, I, that's why I wanted to have you on the show so we could dive into this. It's a really important organ and element of our overall health that's just completely missed most of the time. So why do you think people forget about this? And how is the brain, two questions in one, how is the brain connected with our menstrual cycle? Like why is knowing your brain health important for the menstrual cycle? Well, I think, and I can only speculate why this isn't talked about more. The brain is really complex <laughs> and neuroscientists know a small fraction of what the brain is capable of doing. So it's only within the last couple of decades that we have actual technology to study the brain, like functional MRIs and EEGs and these different modalities to actually study brain function. Um, up until about 20 years ago, we didn't have any of that. And so there was this idea of localization, which just means like, oh, this part of the brain is responsible for this. And this part of the brain is responsible, you know, for, for breathing. And this part of the brain is responsible for visualizing. And though that each part of the brain does have a role, what this concept of neuroplasticity shows us is that the brain is always changing. And people who are born without parts of their brain actually are able to function in a semi-normal way because the brain will change and say, oh, I am actually going to be responsible for that thing that this person wasn't born with. It's this beautiful organ that we know so, so little about, but the idea of localization was debunked and we started to study the brain, understand that it changes, understand that it changes with everything that we do, the things we pay attention to, the thoughts that we have, um, the TV shows that we watch, everything that we do impacts the brain. And I think it being so complex is one of the reasons why it's not talked about more. But it's this control center for the body. And one thing, if, if you're taking away anything from this talk today is really, there is always a communication going on between the brain and the body. So even the person who's like, gut health, gut health, gut health. Okay. Well, yeah, gut health is important. But, you know, you look at the vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve the longest nerve in the body that innervates all of these organ. It goes from the base of the brain all the way down to the gut. And this is a way that our brains and our guts can communicate. <laughs> and thinking 
of that communication. And okay, when we actually take care of our gut, we're making changes to the brain and vice versa. When we focus on brain health, we make changes to the gut, right? And there's a lot of information about the vagus nerve out there, stimulation of the vagus nerve. Yeah, that's it, a prime example of the gut brain connection. So you can't have one without the other. When we change our brain, we change other parts of the body because our brain communicates with other body parts through hormones, through neurotransmitters, right? So that's when now I can start talking about, you know, the menstrual cycle and the brain's role in the menstrual cycle. So, so important. And, you know, I, I like to, to use this example because it's uh, it, it's one that makes sense to a lot of people. So I'm going to use the example of experiencing the symptom of brain fog, which is something a lot of us experience day to day. Right, right? example. <laughs> so brain fog. Um, yeah. Okay. What happens when you have brain fog? So you're sluggish. You tune out. Maybe you zone out. Um, one of the reasons why we may experience this symptom is because there's so much going on in our lives. We feel this sense of overwhelm, stress, and even danger. So it's like one of those times where you go to your computer first thing in the morning, maybe you had your coffee, you're all like, okay, let's go, let's do this. And you sit down at the computer and you look at your to-do list and you've got like 30,000 things on there. And you just can't do one of them. <laughs> You're like, I can't even start this. Like, I can't even do this because I, or, or you don't even know why. You maybe just start to zone out, right? Or maybe do something else or scroll social media or something else. And so you're like, and then you're like, what, what was I doing, right? What was going on? So we pick up information from our environment and we are able to say and look at that to-do list and our brain says, ooh, this is dangerous. There's so much going on here. And so what happens is we pick up information from our environment through our senses, right? Our sensory experiences. We read that. We're like, oh, stressful. Okay. So, you know, our body responds with that stress response. So the hypothalamus says, okay, everyone hypothalamus is in the middle of the brain that really communicates to the rest of the body and says, Hey, there's danger present. We need to respond like there's danger present. Go, go, go. And the pituitary gland, which I know you talk about quite a bit is in really close proximity to the hypothalamus and is always communicating. So the pituitary gland we know is that hormone control center of the body. And okay, pituitary gland is getting this message of danger from the hypothalamus. So pituitary gland says, okay, we got to go. We got to go into action and respond like there is danger present. So what's interesting about the pituitary gland is it's responsible for, you know, making a slew of hormones that communicate to the rest of the body. So two being FSH, which is the follicle stimulating hormone and LH, which is luteinizing hormone. So these are gonadotropin hormones, which means that they tell the ovaries to secrete other reproductive hormones like progesterone, estradiol, testosterone. And if it's getting the message of stress, what's going to happen? Well, that's when you get your lab test and you say, oh, my hormones are dysregulated. What's going on? <laughs> right? What is this? Why, why do I have dysregulation, such low progesterone, such low testosterone, right? That was me when I was going through Lyme disease. It was like every single one of my hormones was low. And I'm not necessarily saying they always have to be low. It's typically a dysregulation. So some you may notice are really high. It, it actually is just a dysregulation that happens. One of the reasons is because we're focused on stress. 
And the body is going to do anything it possibly can to focus on keeping you alive. Hormones, they don't make the cut right? The, the digestive tract doesn't make the cut. And you may find yourself having a harder time digesting food properly. Or um, you may notice like, oh, I'm constipated now, right? So detoxing doesn't make the cut. There are things that our body does in order to keep us alive. And it's a beautiful thing. And it's part of the mammalian animal experience, But what has happened in this day and age is we have those 30,000 things on our to-do list. We, um, (laughs) we, we do things that stress us out all the time. We're surrounded by traumatic events. And now we have more capability of watching traumatic events on social media, on TV, on all of these um, devices. Technology has um, just escalated so much and our nervous systems and our brains have not changed that much. So now we are put into that stress response more often than not. And I hope that was a clear example of how the brain, you know, directly impacts, um, you know, the, uh, the female reproductive cycle. And so what happens is hormones get dysregulated, then, you know, okay, I'm late for my period, right? And then I get more PMS symptoms, right? And so then you experience the real you know, tangible symptoms of that dysregulation that can be initiated by that stress response. Mm, It's so, I'm just like, uh uh uh-huh, 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 (laughs) uh-huh, listening to you. I love this so much, Lindsay. Um, I love that you mentioned about keeping you alive. Something I'm always telling clients and I teach inside the Well Women Academy is that Yes, you're a reproducer. You know, we have the beautiful gift of conception and conceiving and growing a baby and growing an organ and then birthing the organ and birthing a baby and not dying. We have this beautiful gift, but, you know, your body wants to keep you alive. Like its number one goal is to keep you alive and do the things that your body requires to do, to keep you alive. And if you're in a stress response, res- res- blah, blah, blah. If you're in a stress response state, your body's not going to be like, can you look after a baby right now? It's going to say, no, actually, this is not the right situation to grow a baby or look after a baby. So it actually closes down that system slowly. And like you were saying, the delay of the hormones or the um, the dysregulation of hormones is such a big response that I actually have cl- like labeled it as a stress cycle. And I teach this to our menstrual cycle coaches in their certification program that we now have clinical stress cycles in our menstrual cycle as a response to stress. And I think a lot of us think in the outside world that are just getting to know our menstrual cycle that, oh, it's just to do with the stuff around our hips, right? It's in our womb bowl. But your cycle is connected to so many different elements of your body and your overall health. And the brain is a really big one Mm. because without brain health and without functioning, like you said, hypothalamus and pituitary glands, you don't have optimal production of hormones and non-optimal production of hormones throws out your fertility. When your fertility is thrown out, you actually then throw out your period. Your period doesn't get thrown out first. It's a ricochet, mm-hmm. like a ripple effect, like a, you know, dropping a, a stone or a, um, a rock in a pond and rippling across. It's not the start. So we have to go back to the start and the brain is one of those starting things. So thinking about it as a starting point, how can we like, tell us how we can support best those brain fog symptoms, those signs of overall stress on the body that like the freeze fight flight responses, how can we notice those in our daily life? And then what could we do to support them? Yeah. So I want to point out to that brain fog is often the freeze response. And so it's sort of the freeze response disguised as this brain fogginess. And so the freeze response, again, it happens when we feel that sense of overwhelm and the freeze response is the body's way of saying, this is so stressful. I think the best thing to do is tune out, zone out. It's not a conscious thought. A lot of people blame themselves for having these different stress responses, but I will point out, Stress responses were designed to protect you. 
Like, thank you, stress responses for keeping me alive Mm. because this is part of being a human and an animal is dealing with these stress responses. So you may be listening and think, oh my goodness, I zone out all the time. I have brain fog, freeze response is bad. The freeze response, fight or flight, these responses were designed to keep us alive. And how we are kind of meant to experience them is toggling in and out of them throughout the day and then accessing our parasympathetic rest and digest response when we need it, right? And that's the time where we can like, oh, focus on the digestion and rest and recalibrate and regenerate and all of these things that that we're meant to do, go to sleep. And because there is so much going on, we tend to feel so much overwhelmed. What often happens is we can stay in these responses more often than not, and be in this sympathetic dominant response. And that's when it can have a detrimental impact on our health. So if you're feeling like you're in one of these responses, maybe you're super anxious or you have a chronic condition or an autoimmune disease, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm in these responses and it's so bad. Initially, they were designed to protect you. So if you think that is you today, first of all, have a little bit of grace on yourself for this protection mechanism doing its best, right? Doing its freaking best to try to try to keep you alive. It doesn't mean that it's a bad response. It means that it needs some attention and a little bit of rewiring and retraining. So first, become aware of these responses. What you can do is, um, (laughs) I don't love timers or alarm clocks. I actually, I don't use one anymore and I wake up naturally every day. But for this exercise, you'll need an alarm, um, maybe on your phone. I like the chime. If my phone is gonna be ringing, it's always the chime. Um, If you have like a soothing alarm, I recommend playing that three times a day for about five days or even a week if you wanted to do it. Just set that alarm to go off multiple times throughout the day. So maybe 10 a.m., 1 a.m., 4 p.m. And when it goes off, just take a moment and check in. How am I feeling in this moment? What am I thinking about? And is this related to a stress response? So sometimes we don't always, oftentimes we don't always catch ourselves in an anxious loop or in a stress cycle, that negative feedback loop. So it's often when we're experiencing anxiety, we're ruminating, we're spending time like, oh, I'm ruminating on, I don't know why I'm experiencing this. I don't know what's going on. And then the alarm goes off and you're like, oh, okay. What is, what am I thinking about right now? How do I feel? And is this related to a stress response? So having, asking yourself these questions and it doesn't matter the answer. Sometimes your answer will be no and you can give yourself a little hug and move on. And sometimes your answer is yes, I'm in a fight response. And you can give yourself a little hug and move on. We're just getting a little bit of information. So by the end of that five days to a week, then you can say you have this information about how your stress response is showing up in your life. And by the way, I will offer you know your listeners a free trial to my seven-day trial brain retraining course called Reset. And this will walk you through this exercise, but also give you some extra tools to use throughout the day if you're in that cycle of anxiety or whatever symptom it is. Um, So that's also an option. So I'm not leaving you high and dry here. But being able to come back to you and identify those stress responses. So at the end of the week, you can identify your primary stress responses and start to recognize that it's there, that this is how I'm responding. Maybe your go-to is freeze. Maybe your go-to is fight or flight. Okay, so now that I have this information and I'm recognizing these are my primary 
go-to stress responses. What's that next step? And that's where you can tap into tools um, that I offer, like in Reset. You can use any tool that you kind of gravitate towards as well. A lot of people are familiar with, you know, breathing. Maybe it's the box breath that you like, that inhale for four, holding for four, exhaling for four, holding for four. Maybe do that four times in the moment you notice yourself in that fight flight response. If it's this freeze response and we tend to feel more immobile, that's often the time where I'll recommend doing something a little bit more active. So even getting up, moving from your environment, maybe taking a step outside and kind of shaking out your body. Um, if you're in an office, if there's like plants or something, getting up and going to look at a plant, right? Moving your body to just shift and change your perspective, your point of view. And then if you're at home, one of my go-to ones is getting up and dancing dancing, putting on a go-to dance song and moving my body. Our protective mechanisms, our stress responses are designed to protect us, but they don't always respond appropriately because of the level of stress that we deal with day in and day out, especially if you're dealing with a chronic illness. So this is less about saying these responses are bad and more about identifying them and knowing and learning how to regulate our nervous systems so that we can really connect with our own natural resilience. I love that. I always feel like my natural response to everyone's like, oh my God, I love that. And I love this and I love that. So empowering to know that it can be done so simply. And I really enjoy that you mentioned that it's not bad that we have a stress response. And I always say that like, we're no longer running away from tigers and we no longer have someone chasing us with a spear down the street. You know, we don't experience that. And it's very common and natural for a lot of people to just forget that we are animals and that we, we have a natural comparing and we have natural competition and we have natural freeze and flight and, um, and and fight flight and fight and we forget about that because we live in this modern world but there is so much like you mentioned that can stress us out and I feel that a lot of us are unaware of the stress that's there and we just take it on all this is just part of our lives instead of actually recognizing and I think even with emotions most people are so afraid to feel the emotion because they can't recognize it in the first place I love your little plan and um, suggestion of having the timer and dancing. And I had a vision when you mentioned that about people in a workplace, just picking up their phone, going to the toilet, playing like a song on loud for like one minute. And then like a colleague walking <laughs> in, like you're just like, you know, yeah, you know, shaking your ass in the bathroom. Yeah. Um, yeah. But twerking. it's such, yeah, twerking. It's such an easy thing to do. And, you know, I can often see my partner, we both work from home, you know, he can easily get stuck in the freeze. And his thing is I need to go to the beach for a quick swim. And he, it's, it takes less than 10 minutes. He just has to pull himself out. And I'm like, you just have to go to the beach now. And sometimes he doesn't want to, when he's in that moment, but afterwards, oh my God, it's like, you've just started a new day. Mm. I love that. Um, we can retrain our brain so simply. And I always like to say, Lindsay, that it's so easy to do. It's also so easy not to do. And mm. often it's the easy things that are the best things for us, not the complicated, having all the supplements, doing all the diet changes, working out consistently or having, you know, the hardcore PT training you at the gym. It's the simple things that can create really big change and difference. What do you say about that? I love that you said that. And I think brain retraining, that term feels really complicated, uncomplex, but I tell people when they hear about it for the first time, we're all brain retrainers. We're all doing it all the time. Whatever you're paying attention to changes your brain or trains your brain, right? The habits that we get into, the routines that we have. So all that we're doing with this work is making intentional changes to our brains. And I know you and I were talking about intention prior to starting out this episode and being intentional 
about the changes that we choose. So, you know, your partner is saying, oh, I'm in, maybe he doesn't call it the freeze response. Maybe he's like, er, I'm feeling a little like wonky. I'm feeling a little bit er, just out misaligned. I'm going to go do something different. And he does that. And it's this recalibration to this his system, this, this re-immersion into like, oh, this is why I wake up. This is why I'm actually happy. And this is who I am. And this is what I like to do. So being intentional is extremely important. And that's all that I do in vital side is intentional brain retraining. Like, mm. how do you want to feel? Is it peace? Is it a lot of people who have a chronic illness? It's peace and ease and calm for some people it's joy and excitement and motivation in my life again but we're putting you in the driver's seat you're being intentional you are choosing and you are deciding the response that you want to have how empowering that we have those choices and they're all around us at any moment of any day and it just goes to show it can be really easy. So thank you for sharing. And I love that intentional brain retraining. <laughs> um, now, what before we, like we're getting, like we're running out of so much time. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about period brain. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people talk about mum brain, but let's talk about period brain because I've heard a number of clients be like, oh my God, I just have period brain today and I just can't think. How does the brain impact our thought process, particularly when we're menstruating? Yeah. So there's a lot of reasons why you can have period brain. So if you've never heard of that term, you probably have felt it yourself where you just kind of feel like you're slow moving, like you forget things. You could go into another room and be like, oh, why am I here? <laughs> what did I need? Like, what, what is it I was looking for? This literally happened to me two days ago. And I went into that room twice and I was <laughs> like, damn it. What is it that I wanted? Um, <laughs> and it was period brain, right? I was getting my period. So there's a lot of different reasons. Um, it, it could be. So I, I won't say this is the only reason, but a, a common reason for getting that period brain, that kind of brain fogginess before or during your period is, is a hormonal imbalance and a hormonal change that happens. So in your menstrual cycle, so in, in the first part of your menstrual cycle, you have these elevated levels of progesterone compared to levels of estrogen. And then in the days leading up to your period, both of these fall. So your progesterone and your estrogen levels lower. So this impacts other hormones and neurotransmitters. And it tends to lower levels of serotonin and increase levels of cortisol. So serotonin is often related to feeling a sense of well-being, motivation, appetite, um, you know, feeling just a sense of connected, you know, feeling good. It's one of those feel good neurochemicals and then increasing levels of cortisol. Cortisol is known as the stress hormone. So these hormones help to regulate your mood and your sense of alertness. So when they're all over the place, they're dysregulated, you're likely to feel that way too. And that's when period brain can occur and you start to just feel not like yourself, right? Not your best to self that you've shown up to every day, every other day. And now you're forgetting things, you know, oftentimes it is that imbalance. Mm, beautiful example and overview of how it actually works. Cause I think people think, Oh my God, am I crazy? Like, why do I have this? And why does my brain change? And that's just a great representation of how we forget that we're cyclical beings. And I think for everyone who is a menstruator to just remember you are cyclical. So you are consistently moving through these different phases of your cycle. And that's very, very natural and normal. Whereas often I find a lot of menstruators really judge themselves for being like, oh my God, last week I was so on it. Why am I not on it this week? 
you know, with their to-do list or maybe their actions at work. So I think it's really humbling for everyone to just be reminded that your body is going through lots of shifts at that time and to really just honor yourself and to take time. And like you said, stop and check in. How am I feeling? What's this a response of Um, or response in? I think that's really, really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing on that, Lindsay. Yes. And, and I think, you know, thank you for normalizing it too, because it's okay to be forgetful and it's okay to be sluggish, right? Like if we were just doing and going all the time, you know, that wouldn't be honoring our cycle. And so being okay with that slowness. And that brings me back to my initial intention this week of having that grace on myself Mm. and just being able to slow down. I think if we talk about that more, we educate our partners on that more, the expectations for us to do more and go and be more in all of these things and be well and feel well all the time. I think it will start to change that trajectory. And so, and that's what we're doing here. That's why we're openly talking about it. So I appreciate Mm -hmm. that. You know, you are very welcome. The more we talk about it, the more we understand and the more normalize these types of conversations that have been shunned for so many centuries start to become more accepted and part of life. And so this is part of life. So let's talk about it is what I like to say. Now, everyone who's listening to this is probably like, oh my God, I need to retrain my brain because every time I walk to the fridge, I forget what I'm getting out. (laughs) So what are your top tips for retraining your brain? You mentioned the amazing one of setting the timer a couple of, you know, times throughout the day for maybe, you know, five to seven days or, you know, up to that full week for the first week, just to check in and make yourself aware consciously of what's going on. What other tips do you have or what are your top tips could be three to five in retraining your brain. Yeah, I'll probably give you two because I don't want to overwhelm people. There's so I have like a database of all these different ways to train your brain and and different tools to use. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's, it can feel like a lot at first. So, you know, I'll, I'll mention since I talked about the vagus nerve before, um, we can talk about that because that's a nice go-to tool to use, which is, uh, there's a lot of different ways to stimulate it. So breathing, we hear a lot about that, taking deep breaths. Um, But two that actually are within that stimulation of the vagus nerve. And when you stimulate the vagus nerve, that sends a message of safety to the brain and that gets communicated to the body. So two ways to stimulate the vagus nerve through humming, so you can actually hum the happy birthday song twice over. Like, mm, 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 mm. I love and, this. And hum, yeah, hum in that way. I actually do that quite a bit. I really like humming. Um, and you can feel that vibration and, and that will make that shift, that stimulation to the vagus nerve. So twice over happy birthday. Another one that's a little bit harder is gargling. So in the shower gargling, and you can try this later today, gargling water and doing the ABCs. So it's gargling water and actually A, B, C, D, and go through it as much as you can. I honestly haven't been able to get through the full alphabet. When I stop, I like start over and it's, it's pretty difficult to do, but even just the process of trying to do it, it Mm. does stimulate that vagus nerve. And then, so those are two vagal toning exercises and one that I do quite quite frequently, just kind of a state changer to use throughout the day that I love because I'm pretty busy. And so in between clients and sessions or whatever I'm doing, I'll just shake it out and I'll blow out my lips too. And I'll go. <laughs> and just shake out my whole body. And I'm really working on prolonging my blowing out the lips, which, um, I want to break that Guinness, uh, world record one of these days, <laughs> but yes, girlfriend. blowing out, right. Yeah. It's a goal of mine, but blowing out the lips, what that actually does is it stimulates those, 
uh, muscles in your face, those cranial muscles, and shaking out your body shifts the energy that you may have stuck and stagnant in your body. And it's one of my favorites because I love to study animals and it's actually a technique that's used by animals in the wild. And if you don't know any animals in the wild, look at your dog the next time they have a wonky encounter with another dog. Like my dog is a hundred pounds and he's just a love like a love dog, like all he wants to do is love everything. But he's so big that when other dogs see him, they can get a little bit agitated. So when Koa sees a dog and the dog's getting agitated, he'll have the encounter. And when the dog leaves, he shakes it out. He shakes out anything he's feeling in that moment to move forward and move on. And animals have these techniques that they use to shift and change the way that they feel. And now that's what humans are doing. That's what we're doing is we're like adopting these tools that we actually innately naturally know, but perhaps have been disconnected from for some time. Mm, Just remembering them. And I think the dog analogy is fantastic. Birds do it too. You know, I I always think of ducks swimming around and they have a little confrontation and they just like flap their wings and like, fine, I'll swim away. And then they just swim off in their own direction. Um, Such easy little things we can all do at any time of the day. Um, The blowing of the lips, I'm definitely going to work on that because I've not actually thought about blowing my lips in that way whilst dancing, but I definitely do the whole dance and shake it off. (laughs) Um, And the humming is fantastic in um, Ayurvedic, I guess, or one of the Ayurvedic um, methods of pranayama breathing practices is humming and you block your ears and Mm -hmm. um, the bumblebee hum. And I love doing that. It's so like awakening for the brain. I feel Um, I went through a phase where I did that every morning. It was like my favorite thing to do on the beach before I went for a swim. And um, I think when it comes to the breath and all these practices, one of the best things is we have the, the, I can't talk today, the availability to do them right now. Like you Mm -hmm. don't need other things. You don't have to buy a device to do this. You don't have to download something to be able to do it. You can literally do it at any time. Maybe you need some water to gargle, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but everything else we can really just do instantly. And so it's, it provides no excuses because everybody can do this. And that's what I love about really simple tips in making great, great change in our body and our health is that it doesn't have to cost you an arm and a leg or half a kidney. You know, we can just get started in making a good change for our long-term health instantly. So fantastic tips. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. And it it just reminds me of like when I was going through my healing journey, you know, you're sitting, you're doing ozone therapy, you've changed your diet, you're scarfing down these supplements, you're, you know, getting IV, you know, infusions. And what was so important to me when I found out all about brain retraining and nervous system regulation was being able to do it at home and being an active part of my healing. And, you know, I know that is part of like Ayurveda. That's part of a lot of different, um, uh, modalities and, and, um, you know, different types of medicine that's used out there. But a lot of times in Western medicine, you are not, you are not an active player in your healing journey and being an active player in that you know, transformed my whole life. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to come home, use the tools, continue to heal. And then, you know, again, be in that driver's seat of your own healing. Mm, Beautiful summary of you are an active player in your healing journey. Such a powerful line, really powerful. Now, early, you mentioned about the reset that you run. Um, Tell us where can we find out about that? Where can we learn about it? And what's the best platform to connect with you on? How can people connect with you who are listening to this? Yes, I will give you that link to reset so that you can offer it to your listeners. So I imagine it'll be in your show notes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It will be, it will be. 
And uh, yeah, so Reset is a great place to start. So I'll offer that seven day free trial to Brain Retraining. And it's just literally seven days, seven videos, all seven minutes or less. So it can be the first thing that you do in the morning. And I give you a quick little tool to use throughout the day. So you can schedule it like one to three times throughout the day. And they're all very, very tangible, simple tools that you can use. And that's a, that's a great place to start when it comes to brain retraining, because again, it can feel overwhelming, but it doesn't have to be. And then you can find me on Instagram at my vital side. I offer a lot of really great free resources there. And that is linked to my website, vital-side.com where you can learn more about working with me, becoming a member. We've got group sessions. I offer private sessions for members. So there's just a lot of really great stuff on the website. Fantastic. Well, as you know, yes, all of those links will be in the show notes. So thank you so much for sharing. And if you feel intuitively called to this, you know how to find Lindsay now. So Lindsay, tell us about your younger self. I have a final podcast question for you that I ask all of our guests. And I'm interested to hear what your response to this is. I want you to think back to your younger menstruating self. So when you got your very first menstrual cycle, your first period, what are three things that you wish you had have known then that you now know today? Number one, I wish I would have known it was okay. (laughs) I was so ashamed. I was so embarrassed. And I remember I got my period at a friend's house and I didn't want to tell her and I didn't want to tell anyone. And I borrowed all of her clothes and got them all bloody. And I had to take them all home with me and wash them. I would have told her it's okay. And it's normal. So really just normalizing getting a period. Um, I wish I would have known that there was <laughs> more than one hole down there. I did not know <laughs> how to put a tampon in. Fantastic. Yeah. For the life of me, I was like, where does this go? And y'all, I my mom is a surgeon. So I knew everything there was to know about the reproductive tract in its structural form. So the uterus. But I didn't know anything about the vagina. <laughs> and um, I, I asked my mom later because I was like, why didn't we know anything about it? And she was like, oh, I just didn't. My my little girls were, I just, you were too precious. I didn't want to talk about that. And I'm like, mom, you have to talk about this. <laughs> but anyway, it's so funny. So yeah, I knew how a baby was conceived and what happened, <laughs> but I didn't know there were two holes. Um, the third thing, um, that there are different options. Like I have always been such a heavy bleeder and I kind of felt abnormal. Like I was wrong or bad or not doing something right. So just that there are like different options to support yourself with, uh, you know, you know, different options to really just support your period and what that could look like for you. Like right now, I mean, now, you know, I'm obsessed with the different underwear options that are offered that are super absorbent because, you know, a tampon never just cut it for me. So especially now in this day and age, having those different options, I think is so beautiful and really important. So, um, yeah, those are my three. Oh, so beautiful. I really love that you said there's more than one hole down there. And <laughs> we are very fortunate that the era that we're living in right now, there are so many options. And whilst a lot of the options were developed a long time ago, it's taken such a long time for them to come out into the public eye and be talked about openly. And so I think yeah. that we've just made such big drastic changes in the last couple of decades around the menstrual movement. And it's really empowering for a lot of future menstruators. So thank you for sharing your younger three tips. And thank you so much for being here on this episode and joining us and sharing all the things we need to know about our brain health and retraining our brains and really getting to understand the importance of the brain. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This was a great conversation.
Thank you so much for tuning into every episode of the Well Woman podcast. For everything we mentioned in today's episode, you can find this in the show notes over at wellsome.com forward slash podcast. If this episode excited you, please hit follow on Spotify, which means all of my episodes will pop up in your feed weekly so you never miss a weekly drop. I'd love you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts too. Love this episode? Come and follow me over on Instagram at wellsome underscore Gemily. Say hi and share what you've taken away from this episode with me. Now, is there a bestie, sister, or a friend who you know who might be fed up, frustrated, and confused with their cycles? Are they ready to join you in awakening their cyclical essence too? Well, take a screenshot of this podcast episode, share it on your socials, email it, text it, or any way you need to get it to them. So together, we can all live in flow, harmony, and balance with our cycles. Now, until next time, beautiful, get connected, listen to your body, and remember, body confidence all begins with living in tune with your menstrual cycle.